Good evening, everybody. Coming to you live from my kitchen. Well, it's good to be with you all tonight. And I just want to take a moment to pray and ask the Lord to help us all to really get what I'm going to um, teach about tonight. Um, I'm not an expert in this subject matter. Um, I'm just a student learning at the feet of Jesus like everybody else. So Lord, I just ask that you would just please help me to get across what I want to get across tonight. I pray that everything that I say would point to you, God, and that you would get glory from everything that I say tonight, God. And I just pray that it would touch the hearts and minister to anybody that is listening tonight. And I pray that the word would not return void and would accomplish what you have designed it to accomplish in Jesus name. So um, the title of my message tonight is my great army I sent among you. And tonight I want you guys to think about a trust ongoing that's um, still happening. Maybe it's something that you experienced in the past. Maybe it's a little thing, maybe it's a big thing, but whatever it is, get something in your mind that you're facing right now that, um, or you've faced in the past and, and think about that as I'm teaching because I'll let the cat out of the bag. The point of my message tonight is that we can trust God through everything we go through in life he has a purpose to everything that he's doing. As the book of Ecclesiastes says, um, there's a purpose to every season under heaven. God is working out all things together for our good. So my texts tonight are largely from Joel, the book of Joel, um, one of my favorite books of the Old Testament. Um, it's short and it's sweet. Um, so I'll just begin to read. Uh, the first scripture is Joel 1, 4. That which the palmer worm hath left hath the locust eaten, and that which the locust hath left hath the canker worm eaten, and that which the canker worm hath left hath the, can has the caterpillar eaten. Have you ever been in a place in your life where you just feel like everything's gone, everything's destroyed, this situation is untenable, um, this is not going to end well, you know, whether it's financial or relational or spiritual or any other kind of trial or step or, or, or trial that we go through, we can always know that God has a purpose. Even when we feel there's nothing left, we're never left hopeless. In a little bit later on here, in Joel, in uh, verse 225, listen to this. He says, and I will restore to you the years that the locust has eaten, the canker worm and the caterpillar and the palmer, palmer worm, my great army that I sent among you. And you will eat in plenty and be satisfied and praise the name of the Lord your God. That's worship. That hath dealt wondrously with you and my people shall never be ashamed. And you will know that I am in the midst of Israel. That's communion. That's the presence of God in our lives. And that I am the Lord your God and none else. And my people shall never be ashamed. He says that twice. They'll never be ashamed. We're never going to be ashamed in God. We're never going to be ashamed by what God is trying to work out in our lives. He will always come through for our good. And the interesting thing, I thought about this when I was reading it. I was like, my great army, God sends some of these things into our lives. God has a plan. And the fact is that, yes, he does. Um, just as a little sidebar, which I thought was really interesting, I found out when I was studying this, when we see the use of repetition in the word of God, like holy, 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 or um palmer worm, canker worm, and caterpillar. We see that kind of repetition. It's not by random chance. It's actually a rhetorical device, apparently. 
It's a rhetorical signal indicating something of special significance, completeness, permanence, and expectation. So, but not disconnected. So imagine, if you will, beginning, middle, and end. So a process, okay? And what's really cool is that when we see three plus one in the Word of God, four things, um, it's the, what it means is it's the indi it indicates the fulfillment of God's plan. So I thought, how cool is that? That in this case, we're looking at three insects, and all of these insects have something in common with each other. They are all transformational beings. They start out as one thing, and then through the course of time and a process, they come out as something different. Oftentimes, what comes out on the other side is a flying insect, and often it's something very beautiful. Think about a monarch butterfly or something like that, something very beautiful. So here we have God saying that I'm going to send my army. This army of caterpillars, this army of, of transformational beings, and I'm going to use that to accomplish something in the lives of my children, in the lives of my people. And when I'm finished, it's going to be finished. It's going to be a perfect work. And yes, this perfect work does take a lifetime, but it's well worth it. In the end, we will have perfect. We, we will be like him when we get to heaven. We will have a great reward when we get there, when we've gone through the fiery trials that do try us. Everything that God does has a purpose and it is for our good. So um, think about it. God loves us so much that he won't let us stay the same. He won't let us stay in our same old carnal nature with our carnal responses. He loves us so much. He wants to change us from glory to glory into his image. Um, the DNA of what these beings are, it's in them from the very beginning. God knows what he's doing, and he knows he has a plan and an ending. Think about this. Before God even saves us. He knows all of our past mistakes, but not just our past mistakes. He knows all the mistakes that we're going to make in the future as well. And yet he still saves us. So sometimes when we're in that thick, fiery trial, we can become so discouraged. We can be so become so discouraged that we might want to throw in the towel and think, I'll never get this Christianity thing right. I'll never get it. But the thing is that as long as we stay in the process, we keep, you know, a righteous man falls seven times but rises up again. It's the wicked that falls and stays down. As long as we keep getting up and trying again and praying and doing all of these things, which I hope hopefully we'll have time to discuss, um, God will will accomplish what he wants to and, and make us into what he wants us to be. We can be confident of this very thing that he which has begun a good work in us is faithful until the day of Jesus Christ to complete it. God doesn't start something that he doesn't finish. So this is the reason he sends the great army among us. How long will we be in this fiery trial? We don't know. But what we do know is that the trial can be a catalyst for change. God is giving us this trial sometimes, or sometimes it's just life and other people and circumstances that can bring the trial. But even things like that, God has a plan. I can't emphasize that enough. God has a plan. God will do his part, the miraculous, if we do our part. Our part, prayer, worship and praise, coming to the house of God, feeding on the word of God, reading the word of God, studying the word of God, speaking the word of God, believing the word of God. This is how we fight and do our part in the battle. God has the power to change and transform every person who is willing to stay in the process. Nothing is too hard for God. No matter what your struggle, forgiveness, 
anger, greed, addiction, nothing is too hard for our God. We will see a difference, but we all, with open face beholding as in a glass, the glory of the Lord are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. God will do the work in us if we let him. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. All things are become new. We are being made new. It's not a work that happens overnight. It is sometimes many, many of the things that are ingrained in us can take a lifetime to work out. But that's okay. Stay in the fight. Stay in the battle. Don't leave. Don't walk away. Don't give up. Don't throw in the towel. Don't backslide. Stay in the battle. You will get there and you will see the glorious transforming power of the Lord. I, there's no way I'm going to get to all of my notes, but can I just share something that happened tonight? I was in a course all day today online on Zoom. And then um, at about 4.30, the course only had about half an hour left, um, I got a text message from Luke and a phone call saying he needed to be picked up from the gym. So I kind of scooted out of my course and I'm looking for um, my husband to say, you got to go get and get Luke. He's outside walking the dogs. The next thing I know, he's in the house saying, you know, our dogs just got, Jesse just got hit by a car. So Jesse got hit by a car. I'm in the course. This is this Lucas has to get picked up. There's this big kerfuffle happening. I mean, a highly, highly, highly stressful few moments of time, right? And a friend of mine was here, Abby, and she. Uh, I said, I'm, I'm. I found the dog. I went out and looked for it with Matt. The dog had run into the garage, unbeknownst to us. I'm like holding the dog. Matt's still walking around outside looking for the dog. And I just, I'm like looking at the dog, trying to see where she's hurt. And I said, Abby, can you just go outside and, and tell my husband that I found the dog, right? So anyways, she, she goes outside, brings him in, and then he kind of rips into me because he's super stressed out, right? He just saw this dog get hit by a car and run off and he's super stressed out. And he's like, why didn't you tell me that you, you found the dog? And I'm just like, I did, I did, right? And I'm just thinking, after this all settled down, the dog is okay. We don't think he's been injured. There's a little bit of blood on his lip. Everything's fine. I'm illustrating this story to say that immediately I'm thinking to myself, okay, I could have handled that better. Okay, but you know what? God, God is so good. First of all, the dog's not hurt. Second of all, what used to bother me so much, an offense, Okay, I'm not being treated fairly, blah, 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 blah. What used to bother me so much, God has helped me to see that holding on to resentments and anger and bitterness and letting it stew, that was my nature. But God is slowly transforming me. I can see it. Hopefully other people can see it. But I can, I know on the inside of me that God is doing a work in me. And so something that I would have, I would have gone to bed angry. I would have, you know, so could I have been even more patient? Yes, but it's a process. So I just wanted to say all of that to say that, that we sometimes don't see the change. It's, it's happening, it's happening in us slowly, but believe me, God is changing us. I can, I could, I could list over and over and over again, examples of, of ways that God, I'm not where I want to be, but God has brought me a mighty long way. Ezekiel 36, I digress. Ezekiel 36, 26, a new heart will I also give to you and a new spirit will I put within you. I will take out your stony heart of flesh and I will give you, I will take out your stony heart out of your flesh and I will give you a heart of flesh. It's a beautiful thing what God does in the life of a believer, in the life of a Christian. Through the power of the Holy Spirit and through the power of Christian disciplines, He will, he, He's molding us, He's making us as long as we stay in game.
Romans 12, 2, be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. When we stay in the fight, God will change us and he will get the glory. When people see us, and they see that we react differently, that we're not what we used to be, who's going to get the glory? God will get the glory for that. And we can be confident that he who started a good work in us will complete it. Thank God for that. So a lot of this happens, um, you know, as we read the word of God, we're being changed, as I said, from glory to glory. As we think in our heart, that's how we are. So we pour the word of God into us. We pray. These things will slowly over time change us. Our thoughts determine our actions. Our actions determine our habits. Our habits change our our, our habits change our actions, and this changes our life. It's a process of our thinking, our beliefs, our actions, and our lives are changed. Complete surrender is necessary. Romans 12.1, present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable. It's our reasonable service. He's not asking too much of us, but it will take all of our hearts dedicated to him. Stop and think just for a second of all the people that you can think of in the Bible that had to undergo some kind of trial to be changed and become better to become a better human being. I mean, it's over and over again. Samson, okay, he was on the wrong path. God had to send him a pretty big trial, blindness, the lack of all his power, imprisonment, slavery, for him to wake up and come to his senses. Jonah, Jonah wanted to, God said, I want you to do this. I want you to go and preach to the Ninevehs. The Ninevehs, the Ninevehs, they suck. I don't want to do that. He runs away. God throws him in the belly of the whale for three days. He's like, oh, where do you want me to go? Yeah. Jonah, Miriam, she got all uppity, okay? And God had to send her, you know, leprosy for her to realize, okay, yeah, maybe I shouldn't, um, you know, touch the anointed of God. Um, uh, David. Think about David. He should have been out to battle um, when he was uh, spying on Bathsheba. And then he, he commits adultery with her. And then he you know, commits murder. And then he lies about it. And Nathan the prophet says, David, you're the man. And he went to prayer and he went to repentance. And, um, and he was changed through that circumstance that fiery trial of having Nathan point out his fault and having his firstborn son um, perish and I mean we can look at Paul Paul was persecuting Christians until he was thrown off his high horse on the Damascus Road and uh, struck with blindness until he said you know who art thou and, and we know how that ended. And he ended up becoming the greatest apostle, probably. Uh, he wrote two-thirds of the New Testament. And even after that, Paul needed to have a thorn in the flesh, right? So God can send this mighty army of affliction and trial. And um, we can go, why, 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 why? But it is working out something that is far greater. 2 Corinthians 4.17 says, For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we look at the, not at the things which are seen, but at things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. So think about it, our light affliction. Sometimes our trials don't feel like they're very light. They actually feel pretty weighty and we can be bowed down, but we need to keep it in a perspective because the word says that it's going to work out. It worketh, it's in the trial, the working out, the worketh, that's an ongoing thing, is working out something in us that only that, 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 that trial could work out. What is it working out? 
glory, a greater weight of glory. Think about it. God's glory being seen in us by how we are transformed while we're in the trials. What, a t what an awesome witness. What an awesome witness. This is a testimony when we can be in a trial and we can still face that adversity and learn how. It's a learning process. Learn how to face that adversity um, and, and stay in that cocoon of transformation. Um, only, I, I underlined this, that worketh, it makes the glory to be. It's that working out in the struggle alone is spiritual progress possible. I can't really name where I've grown spiritually in my walk with God when I was on the mountaintop. You know, that's the reward for the struggle. Um, it's been in the struggle where I've become come face to face with the areas of my life where I needed to change, where I needed more patience, where I needed more forgiveness, where I needed to quench a bitter root, whatever it was, it was in that trial that I became better. And sometimes I was bitter, but I stuck with the process. And in the in due course of time, um, those things are being changed. And, and that's how God, God does it. The end of a thing is greater than the beginning. The latter rain is greater than the former rain. Death is greater is a greater time than our birth. Um, though the beginning was small, yet the latter end should greatly increase. That's Job 8, 7. Ecclesiastes 7, 8. Better is the end of a thing than the beginning of thereof. Philippians 1, 6. Being confident of this very thing, that he which has begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Ecclesiastes 3.10, I've seen the travail which God has given to the sons of men to be exercised by it. By it. He has made everything beautiful in his time. What a beautiful scripture. That's a beautiful. He has made everything beautiful in his time. Even me, Lord. Even me with all of my shortcomings and faults, all my bad habits, all my addictions, all my hatred and anger, even me, Lord, no, God is going to make something beautiful out of my life, beautiful out of your life if we stay in the process. So we have to ask the right question, not, Lord, why am I going through this? Because the rain will fall on the just and the unjust alike. Not why am I going through this, but Lord, what do you want me to learn from this trial? Asking the right question can keep you on the right path. When we don't understand what God is doing, this is an opportunity for our faith to be exercised. When we can see, when God allows us to see what he's trying to do, that's great. But sometimes we don't see what's, what he's trying. We don't see, what are you trying to do here, God? We, I don't understand. This is too heavy. But that is an opportunity. See it as an opportunity to, to grow your faith, to grow your trust. Because remember, the things that we, we see, the, faith is the, the evidence of things not seen, right? If we see it, it doesn't require any faith. But when we don't see the end from the beginning, we just have to trust that God is working all things together for our good to them that are called, to them that love the Lord and are the called according to his purpose. So I'm winding up here and I think I'm on time. Praise the Lord. God understands human nature so well. Of course, he made us. He knows we will get lazy, complacent, rebellious, arrogant, unthankful, have a sense of entitlement if we, um, if we are left to our own devices. Jesus said, how hard is it for the rich to enter into the kingdom of heaven? It's harder than a camel to pass through the eye of a needle. So I was thinking about this, you know, in North America, we are all rich. And in the kingdom of God, if you're saved and in the church, you are very rich indeed. So, so we need to understand that it's easier for the camel to go through the eye of the needle. Think of the Laodicean church. They thought they were rich 
and increased with goods and had need of nothing. But God said they were actually blind, naked, wretched, and poor. So to help us, God gives to each life its own set of challenges because we, he knows that we do better under adversity than under blessing. And he will never give us more than we are able to bear. He will always, always just give us just the right amount that we can handle. So trust in that promise too. Think of the early church. They were scattered and persecuted, and yet this was the vehicle that God used to evangelize all of Asia. Even so, even then, he knew that people had a tendency to complacency, if not outright rebellion. So we see when God sends pestilence, locusts, shuts up the heavens, he's doing it to work a general good for mankind, i.e. the pandemic, um, and a specific good for the church and for the individuals in the church. In Joel 2.18 to 3.21, this is a long passage of scripture, but I'm, I'm winding down now and I just, I mean, like I said, Joel is one of my favorite books in the Old Testament. He talks about many blessings that are going to come to the people of God. Blessing over blessing over blessing. But what is going to trigger the blessing? Okay, what is our part in the trial? I'm just going to go ahead and read. Therefore also now, saith the Lord, turn ye even to me with all your heart, and with fasting, and with weeping, and with mourning, and rend your heart, repentance, and not your garments, and turn unto the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and of great kindness, and repenteth him of the evil. Who knows if he will return and repent and leave a blessing behind him? Blow the trumpet, that's give a certain sound, thank you, pastor, in Zion, sanctify a fast, call a solemn assembly, gather the people, sanctify the congregation, assemble the elders, gather the children, um, those that suck breasts, let the bridegroom go forth of his chamber and the bride out of her closet. Let the priests, the ministers, that's us, of the Lord, weep between the porch and the altar and let them say, spare thy people, O Lord, give not thine heritage to reproach that the heathen should rule over them. Wherefore should they say among the people, where is their God? God will not let us, he won't leave us hanging and he, we will never be ashamed. Then will the Lord be jealous of his land and pity his people. Yea, the Lord will answer. Now, my final scripture for tonight, and some of you are going, who, um, is in 2 Chronicles. And I know this is a, a really famous passage of scripture, but we sometimes don't back it up just one verse. God says, if I shut up the heaven and there be no rain, or if I command the locusts to devour the land, or if I send pestilence among my people, if my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, will forgive their sin, will heal their land. Then, now mine eyes shall be open and my ears attend unto their prayer. So, final thought. When we are in the fire of trial or adversity, we can know that there is a purpose and a plan. We will be transformed in God's good time into something beautiful for the Lord's glory. God will use his great army, the transforming power of trials, to make everything beautiful in his own time. God will do his part, the miraculous, if we do our part and pray. Stay in the boat. Okay, that's my message for tonight. So I'm gonna have a quick look at Facebook here and um, see what's going on. If anybody has a comment that they would like to, um, that, that, that they would like to uh, comment or share or question, um, 
I'd be uh, so happy to read it out and um, we can have a bit of a discussion here. Um, not seeing comments, I might have to go out here. I'm just going out and going back in. Okay, there we go. So I see Jennifer saying hello to everybody, Sister Carol, Sister Margaret, Sister Linda, um, Pastor, thank you, good stuff. Does anybody have any questions, any comments that you'd like to post? Just watching for it for a minute here. Okay, well, apparently there's not a lot of comments, so hopefully that's a good sign. Um, God bless you all. Thank you for joining in tonight. And um, just pray in closing. Lord, I just thank you, God, that for every season that you let us go through in our lives, that there is always a purpose, always, always, always a purpose that's going to work out for our greater good. And so we can, we truly can give thanks in every circumstance. And we know that that is your will for us. Lord, just go with everyone tonight, wherever they're at, God, just bless them, strengthen them. And, and just help us to really hide your word in our hearts. And we just thank you for your word. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless.